Hey team, thank you so much for taking the time to join us for the second installment uh, of our of our uh, <clears throat> deck design and pitch series here this week uh, with the Deck Doctors team. Really excited for our session today. Uh, Kenzie's going to take it away from me in a split second here. Um, we I got one question in Slack leading up to this, but if anybody has um, questions that they'd like the Deck Doctors team to handle, please pop it into the chat. Uh, Mark and Alex were great about this on Tuesday, too. So my role is pretty much just to be in the background here. So they'll monitor the chat. Um, and, yeah, excited to dive in. Kenzie, all you. Great. Hey, everybody. Um, nice to see all you and meet all you. Um, I am going to pull up the deck and we'll get started. Let's go. Um, hope you all are having a good afternoon so far. Uh, my name is Kinsey. Hello. Um, I will introduce myself. This is a refresher for those of you who are on Tuesday's session, but um, we're the Deck Doctors. Uh, uh, I am working beside Mark and Alex, who are the co-founders of Deck Doctors, and I am the head of creative. Um, a little bit of background about me. I uh, specialize in brand primarily and brand identity. So I really am passionate about bringing people's brands to life and creating really cohesive um, decks in the making of brands um, and uh, really creating beautiful pitch decks that uh, help you get funded. So this is kind of a deep dive of design and decks. Um, this is kind of the design dilemma. I know a lot of Design can be really intimidating, especially if you're just starting out and you don't really have a brand. Um, and this is what it feels like sometimes <laughs> um, when your design doesn't meet your level of ambition or storytelling. Um, but hopefully through this little deck, uh, I can give you five key elements of designing decks. Um, we're going to go through hierarchy, type, color, margin, and motif in this presentation. And this is just kind of the really basics to create a really cohesive um, and visually compelling pitch deck that will live up to your storytelling abilities um, and hopefully get you funded. So this is, diving right in, uh, hierarchy. Um, you all probably know what hierarchy is. Um, and in the design sense is the organizing of elements to convey importance through positioning, scale, color, um, it's leading the viewer's eyes through a predetermined path. So there's many ways that we can create hierarchy on a page. And I think hierarchy is the most important thing when it comes to pitch decks, in my opinion. Um, you're telling your story. It's all about the copy that's on the page um, and really leading, leading the audience to uh, understand what you want them to understand first and what you want them to focus on first. Uh, so ways to create hierarchy in design are size, making uh, type bigger or smaller to lead the audience's eyes through a page, um, weight, uh, so bolding or creating um, contrast between regular and bold fonts, um, bolding out uh, and highlighting out different things that you want a viewer to focus on in a paragraph. Uh, highlighting a sentence within a paragraph is uh, a good a good way to like lead the viewer's eyes to the sentence, the key statement that you want them to read. Um, and color, um, using lighter or darker colors through a deck uh, gives a distinct uh, hierarchy to it, uh, creating contrast between the background color and the, um, and the color of your text or the color of your elements um, creates a sense of hierarchy case so using uppercase uh, for maybe headings or subheadings creates um, kind of differentiation and creates a sense of hierarchy between uh, long forming content and the titles uh, and position uh, where the text or elements are positioned on a page how the white space is uh, acting around your page uh, and for example, in the top left corner, um, viewers normally start there. Uh, so uh, really deciding where you want to put elements on a page and really thinking about what your eye would land on as, as your audience reads your pitch deck. Um, and another hierarchy page 
is we create type stacks. Uh, so a type stack is just a outline of how you want to use some sizing and type throughout your full pitch deck. Uh, we create this at the beginning, big beginning of a deck and we kind of hide it, but we make sure that everything that we create within the deck is consistent sizing wise. So maybe an eyebrow text is a certain size and we create all caps for this. Um, a headline is big, a secondary headline is a little a little bit smaller uh, and body copy that is small enough, uh, but still readable. And we create this type stack to obviously create hierarchy, but to create a sense of composition, create cohesiveness throughout the deck to make sure everything is in alignment with each other um, and that you're not using random um, sizes throughout the deck. It, it uh, eliminates the distractions. Uh, if a type all the all of a sudden it gets bigger, or if you're jumping from slide to slide uh, and text is getting smaller and bigger, when you click forward, it just distracts the viewer. And this is some examples that we've done that I think are interesting examples of hierarchy. So we're using that eyebrow text for the opportunity here. We're using a kind of gradient treatment on the headline that gives it some hierarchy, having color um, we're using a white for these subheads of these different columns, and we're using a off-white um, for the body copy. So this really has a really good sense of hierarchy. It has a good flow. You know, you, this is just a navigational header, so it doesn't really have to be that big. This is the main point of the page, and uh, this having cohesion between all three columns and having that... Um, hierarchy of color and also size helps the reader um, feel that this is organized and feel that this has good flow. Same here, doing the same thing, but we are also using color to highlight uh, words within a title here um, that is creating a sense of hierarchy of where what is most important in this sentence. And some more. Uh, using color again, we are using some a lot of different type sizes here but it all works this is like the titles of each of these um rows here we have a good sense of white space here and this feels pretty organized and gridded out um and the color allows us to really focus on these big numbers that that our client was wanting to focus on here um and using really small copy to give some sources um and here we are using multiple different typefaces. So we're using a serif um, and a sans serif here to create differentiation between the numbers and the actual copy. Um, and we're using different sizes. So big numbers, creating a sense of um, hierarchy here. Uh, we have like very clear, like step one, step two, step three. Um, and just the grid and how it's organized allows it to start here and read down. Um, and I think it's very inherent with like how we used uh, space and copy here to create that hierarchy and that reading order. Um, so just just really thinking about the order that your that your viewer will read read your deck. Um, next is type. So typography and hierarchy go hand in hand. Um, but type is how we deliver our story. Um, and we want our message to be clear, organized, and easy to read. Line length. I know this is a big, a big topic in pitch design because I know a lot of you and a lot of the pitch design community um, loves to go full length with their headers. Um, <laughs> but this sometimes doesn't work as well. Uh, you're reading fully across the slide. Um, it, it kind of leads to strain on, on the viewer's, viewer's attention and, uh, like reading fully across the slide doesn't, uh, create a great experience sometimes. So we tend to condense those titles into one area, um, allow for content to breathe. Um, and so that our, our audience doesn't have to work so hard to read, to read our messaging. And we also try to limit the number of fonts. Um, we like to use just one sometimes, but we should limit the two or three um, and don't go above three if you can help it. 
Uh, this, but um, including multiple fonts allows for more hier hierarchy. So as you can see here, this this team called um, Cloud Poker, they, they used uh, sans, ser or, uh, sans serifs for their body copy and sans serif for their um, subhead, but they use a serif for their headline. Um, so, and serif for uh, their quote element here. Uh, this created a really interesting hierarchy. Um, the use of multiple types of fonts and combining those types of fonts uh, creates intrigue and also creates a, a good sense of, I understand what the title is always in sans serif or serif. Um, the body copy is always in serif. Um, just understanding when to use what type of font and keeping it consistent throughout your deck uh, is super important and that will establish hierarchy and understanding as people run through the deck. Um, and this is another interesting example. This client uh, called Ratio, they used a monotype, which is a type of font that is a little bit um, more techy. Uh, so a monotype paired with a serif. This is a really interesting pairing um, and allows us to uh, create that hierarchy here uh, in interesting ways. So we did big titles uh, uh, and then we use that, that monotype as the body copy. Um, and this is a really interesting sense of hierarchy and interesting sense of combining two different typefaces that work together and create the mood of the, of the brand. And this is just some typography terminology for you. This is all about cleaning up your text and making it not distracting for the viewer. So this is called widows and orphans. I know, terrible, terrible type terms. I hate it so much. Uh, I don't know why they named it this. Uh, but widows are um, type that extends at the end of a paragraph. So um the they like at the beginning of a paragraph um and orphan is a single word that sits at the bottom of a paragraph here um so we correct this by moving that up uh just words that stick out are words that go to the bottom of a paragraph or stick up at the top or are um kind of extending past the sentence they're distracting um they're little details but this is uh, just some small stuff that might distract or might make your paragraphs read in a, an awkward manner. Um, we correct them by extending the paragraph or um, hitting return if we need to or backspace uh, um, to get them all in one line or um, as all in one line as we can. Um, I think just these small details can add up to distract an audience and it's really nice to keep it clean and keep it understandable another thing that distracts is rags a rag in type is when your copy creates these jagged bumpy edges um we don't fully justify text normally in a, a deck design um we, we left aligned um so this is left aligned um but we can um correct this by extending the size of that paragraph um, and just getting it kind of all evened out. Um, this is uh, slightly, so this is as tight as it could with the same copy, getting it a little bit, a little bit bigger. And then um, this is a little bit better, but still has some rag. Um, you can also try to enter words to the next line to try to make it as aligned as possible. Um, just making sure that your thought doesn't um, get cut off randomly at uh, a random intersection of your paragraph uh, and making sure that the, the audience isn't distracted with everything, um, with all the jaggedness here. Uh, rags are easy to eliminate just by fixing uh, the size of the text box. And this is also really important. Um, a lot of the times we get decks and readability and legibility is not um, a factor that they were worrying about. Um, so some don'ts are watch out for your line spacing. Ooh, line spacing. Um, this is a really tight uh, line spacing. All the text is kind of all on top of each other. You can um, fix this by 
uh, correcting your spacing between the lines. We tend to use single space and uh, making sure your contrast between your dark backgrounds and your font color um, are up to up to par and are easily accessible for your viewer. Um, and also using text on very busy, uh, very busy, busy imagery is also something we see a lot. Uh, and this is a really pain point of uh, accessibility here. We tend to create a um, transparent black layer um, shape and um, move that transparency down. So you can get a little bit more contrast between the photo and the text, um, just adding that black layer on top. Um, so you can see, still see that photo in the background um, just adds a little bit more contrast uh, and is something that we see happening a lot in people's decks, wanting to have imagery and wanting to put type on top of it. Color. Um, so color allows us to apply our brand identity very subtly across the deck. Um, I think color is the most subtle way that you can apply by your brand um, because it is not like a huge element, um, but it helps with the look and feel um, to make it feel like your company. Um, and it also uh, can enable hierarchy and navigation as well. So we like to create with tints and tones. Um, so for example, if we are doing a build, for example, in a deck and we are building out um, and exposing one sentence or paragraph at a time, we tend to adjust the transparency or adjust the color to gray these other elements out. Um, as you click through, this next one might highlight and then the third. Um, so we highlight them through color or through, um, or through weight. But here we are highlighting color and then we use tints when we are creating infographics. So using different um, different colors in your palette, you can create um, a real connection between your, your data and your copy or your info in your copy. So creating, um, creating images or, or graphics that relate in a color sense one one to one and making sure your color is matching in the way that it needs to match. Um, so for example, um, if we wanted to make this even stronger, we could go the light purple and put a light purple um, header here, the semi-darker purple and put a, that semi-darker color here, and then the darkest and the darkest here. Um, obviously we'd have to put that on a white background to create that contrast. Um, but really giving a one for one um, color match between the content and what you're trying to lead the viewer's eye to is a, a super effective way to create um, that cohesion and create understandability uh, with um, infographics as well. And then color navigation. This is also a sneaky one and I've been doing it in this deck, I don't know if you noticed, um, but each section in this deck is a different color. So hier hierarchy was light blue and we had the light blue um, little bit of color peeking out from the top of the deck. Type is darker purple and then color is this orange. Um, it's sneaky, but it also helps with navigation and to understand which section of the deck you're in. Um, and it helps viewers get a sense of, okay, I'm in this section of your deck. It helps way find your way through uh, people's pitch decks. And we also do that with colored eyebrows. If we want to be more subtle even. And uh, yeah, that's kind of some really sneaky ways to add color and connect it to your brand identity. And then margin. Margins and grids allows us to create a structure, really, uh, to create a sense of um, a sense of margin and a sense of this is where the deck ends. Uh, it helps everything feel organized and aligned and precise and consistent through the deck. Um, so establishing margin, or again, it helps us feel structured and structured and aligned. A tight margin may feel a little bit more techy, a little bit more modern, where a wider margin may feel more open, more inviting. 
examples of this is this is Idolist. Um, we created a very, very tight margin for this one. Uh, they are very future forward um, and the tight margin allows for more space um, in the middle, but it also creates this kind of uh, forward thinking um, look and feel. Whereas this brand is using a very um, large margin, they want to be very um, humanistic, want to be very open. Uh, this was a child's uh, brand, um, brand for children. So uh, to create that look and feel, we used larger margins to create that openness, um, that friendliness. Uh, also in margin, uh, we always kind of tend to use these running navigational footers or headers in our work for our clients. As you can see here, we have the deck doctors, we have what the name of this deck is and page number. Um, some people want to add proprietary and confidential uh, or their logo um, or the date to the bottom. Um, and these navigational headers really add an extra touch of organization and exposing that grid or that margin. So as you can see, this is where our margins extend and we have aligned everything to that margin. Um, and everything here is aligned to this uh, and stopping here. Um, so it kind of exposes and allows you to align elements to that bottom footer or header um, and it creates a sense of cohesion um, and structure to your to your pitch deck and it's something super subtle that allows people to understand um, if you are referring to a page number or if they're referring to a page number you can look back on your on your deck and uh, know what page you're at uh, and it's just like a really subtle nice element to have these are some examples of a top navigational um, header and a bottom navigational header and with different information for both. Um, it just like creates a very organized feel when everything is aligned to that, when it exposes the margins that you are landing on. Um, and motif finally is um, adding your brand elements and personality into your design decisions um, and into your deck. So to create a motif, and to understand what you should pull out as your brand's motif. Um, if you have guidelines on your brand already, um, looking at your guidelines and um, identifying elements that you want to bring into your deck to make it feel like your brand, um, looking at your logo, your mark within your brand um, and seeing what you can pull out of that for inspiration, looking at the space that your company lies in uh, and the function of your company, um, to identify more elements. So, um, and looking at your website and what types of shapes or imagery or um, motifs that you're using on your websites and looking at shape. So if in your brand or on your website, um, you want to repeat the shapes that you're using. Um, so for example, if you use circles in your brand a lot, you could use pill shape um, bounding boxes. You could create bounding boxes within your design um, that have rounded corners to kind of keep that rounded feel consistent. So you wouldn't want to put circles all over and then create um, boxes as a design element that have sharp corners, for instance. Um, just trying to keep everything consistent. Um, and so these are some examples of motif that we created for clients. This is a spine brand. Um, they helped create a product that helped people with um, spinal injuries. So um, they we created a really subtle and um, beautiful organic look and feel about what uh, what could allude to a spine. And how could we bring those elements out and make them big? Um, and this was just like a really subtle way of using motif, a really simple way, um, using it just directly on the page, cropping it off the corners. This is a brand called Daily Blends. They were using a lot of shapes in their logo, but they didn't want to use that same um, line weight because 
because I thought this was a little bit distracting if this would be in the backgrounds of the slides. So we created a very thinner version of the shapes that they had displayed in their logo um, that they could kind of sink into the background of their slides, um, something super subtle um, that complemented the logo, um, as you can see here. And this is Threat Optics. They created, they had this really interesting, intricate um, graphic already. And we pulled that out to create very functional things. So to create infographics or timelines, we use the same elements in this uh, to create a very branded timeline for them. Chat site, they had this kind of dialogue box. We used that dialogue box to create bounding shapes, uh, which was a very subtle but interesting way to uh, increase uh, brand awareness and put that brand into, uh, into the slide structure. So using that, little chat dialogue as the bounding shape, subtle. Um, this is Cloud Poker again. They had this um, interesting illustration style that they used on their decks themselves, but they also wanted to subtly lean into the space that they're in. So they're in the poker space. So we used um, shapes that you would see on card decks, so diamond, uh, to create very subtle callbacks to the space that they're in. Um, also, this is a, called Burst. We can create um, pattern or expand that pattern that you see in the logo to create full background, full background patterns, full background blends for them to put content on top of. Again, using um, inspiration from the overlaps here to create uh, a branded gradient. So these are all examples of how to take a logo, how to take some brand element and um, use it across the full deck. Uh, this is Hey Jane. You saw a slide from them earlier. They are using these kind of organic shapes. Uh, you can see here, it doesn't really distract from the content itself. It just helps it feel a little bit more branded. And this is the thank you page where we can get a little bit bigger with the elements, a little bit uh, more expressive um, and just expand that brand rec recognition um, across the deck and across the design. And finally, layout design elements. So this is a review kind of uh, text. It's how we communicate in deck design through titles, headings, subheads, paragraphs. We use hierarchy uh, to allow the reader to understand the order that needs to be read in. Imagery, these are photos, illustrations, infographics, um, and they can use to be enhanced to enhance the text um, and the context behind the text that you're using. Line, um, lines help to direct the eye towards different points on your, on your slides. They also help draw boundaries between different elements or di different pieces of text um, and shape. This is something that we talked about earlier creating consistent bounding boxes, consistent use of shape that feels on brand for you um, allows you to feel cohesive um, as, a, as a company and as a pitch deck um, and use of white space. White space that you give between the elements in your design is important for uh, a visual rest for your, for your audience. Uh, you don't wanna jam too much on one page um, really think about what order you would read it in, if there's too much on a page, if you can condense it down. Um, and that white space helps give a little bit of a respite to the audience um, in their reading and in their understanding of your deck. Uh, and that these are the main core, core design elements that you will use to create a really cohesive and visually compelling deck that tells your story um, in the way that you want to to be told. And that is all from me. I will look at the chat now. Um, and I'll pass it over to Mark and Alex if they think they have time to run you through a deck too. I know that was something that they wanted to do, but yeah, that was Kenzie. That was amazing, you. Kenzie. Thanks. Yeah. Um, that was, that was honestly a great refresher for me. Uh, it's just so, so useful to take all the things we do all the time and, and 
forced to consolidate and, and explain them. So thank you, Kinsey. That was that was amazing. Um, as far as this run of show here, because we're about halfway through, Alex and I have two decks that we'd love to pitch back to you all so you can see how the storytelling concepts from the other day and Kinsey's design concepts all come together, particularly for a pre-revenue, pre-revenue companies or early companies. I think let's pause now. Uh, there's some questions here for Kinsey. I know Alex had a few notes to share. So why don't we kind of open it up for discussion for the next 15 and then towards the end, we'll we'll kind of come back and, and show some, some stuff off. Um, Alex, do you want to share your note? I think then the first question here around brand style guides might be for Kinsey and then anything else that comes up, feel free to throw it out there. And then uh, we can address uh, Tayaba and Jonathan's questions too, but I'll pass to Alex. Uh, and thanks again, Kinsey. Awesome. No, I think the the only thing that I was going to add is, well, firstly, I think Kinsey, that was amazing. There's not a lot of content out there on pitch deck design and combining kind of brand design, uh, information design to tell compelling stories. And so I think that that, you know, some that overview shows a lot of expertise in this very specific world of pitch deck design. Uh, so hopefully there was a lot of t actionable tidbits in there that can kind of demystify things for you guys as you're looking to design your pitch decks. Um, I want to note that I think, you know, that especially at the early stages, I think people feel intimidated by, um, you know, the, the, f the fidelity of some designs that maybe we've shown or, you know, the, the kind of work needed to go into building something that does feel really branded and punches above your weight. Um, the, it, it's important because, you know, as we said in the storytelling session, we're looking to build something that helps you stand out in a stack on investors deck. And so good design can only help, uh, it can't hurt that effort. And then, you know, building something that guides somebody's eyes through the, the, the pitch and, and to the important points is, is a big part of how we think about information design. So I think that those are, you know, two reasons why it's useful, um, and then to de demystify things, I, I want to note that all of the designs that you guys saw, you know, all of the decks that we build are in Google Slides. So there's, you know, a lot of tools at your disposal that, you know, you may not be aware, you know, have a lot of strength behind them. And, uh, you know, Google Slides is a really good option. Canva is, you know, democratizing a lot of, you know, high fidelity ability to kind of like play with colors and assets and shapes like that. There's new things like pitch.com and Tome that, you know, help kind of, you know, a, a novice build something that looks really professional. So there's a lot of tools at your disposal uh, if you don't have a, a Kinsey on your team, because a Kinsey's are very, very hard to come by. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, you know, there Google, we I just want to kind of like reiterate that everything we do is, is for the most part in Google slides. And sometimes we'll pull in assets from Canva or we'll pull in assets from that will create in Figma and, and Adobe. But, you know, for the most part, there's a lot of tools at your disposal, especially at the early stage to give your, uh, your look and feel, a a, 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 an advantage. And then I think a lot of the concepts here will help with information design and help have design support your storytelling efforts. Um, so, you know, hopefully that, you know, that that's all really useful as you start thinking about updating your guys' decks. So, um, with that, I will pause for questions for Kinsey. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we want to start with the chat here or if we yeah. want to open it up. Let, let's, let's kind of hit these in the chat. I think the first thing is let's, um, just discuss a little bit, uh, Sarah's question around brand style guides. So the, the short answer is, you know, we're not a brand firm. We have made, we often will push a brand forward in a presentation and then people will maybe end up applying it to the website or it can be like a notional rebrand that they'll then like use for the next stage of their brand. It's actually really fun. Pitch decks are a great medium for experimenting with brand. And if your product looks one way and your site looks another, like there's no harm in, you know, trying to make the, the pitch look even better than both. Oftentimes we'll anchor the pitch to the brand if it's a later stage brand. But um, I just want Kinsey to touch on some of like the common tactics that we do use from the brand world, because that is the background that both her and I come from. And uh, we do some things like territories and uh, probably other things that Kinsey can speak to quickly. So the short answer is we don't do brands, but the, the longer answer is there's a lot of brand thinking in what you just saw. It's just applied to, uh, to presentations. 
Yeah, I think that was a good way to sum it up. Um, we tend to work with uh, companies that um, have guidelines already and we apply those guidelines like Mark said, but when companies come to us with no brand, um, there is an option uh, from us that is a, a separate kind of uh, workflow uh, and a different type of offering where we can help a, a brand with no visual brand uh, and no um, kind of sense of what they want to see from their brand, we will create something called territories. So we will create two to three looks and feel uh, based on what the brand is trying to convey. Um, and those will range in different type of type used, different type of colors used, different type of elements. So each territory would have a different look and feel um, and we hand those off to the client and they choose one um, to go with and we will create a deck from that. But uh, brand design is much more um, much more in depth than what we do. Yeah. Uh, we have the ability to do brand design, uh, but in pitch decks and in the purpose of uh, in the purpose of this, we tend to use an existing brand and elevate that, uh, use existing inspiration from their website, or when there's no brand um, and no visual aesthetic, we can create something called light territories where we can give exploratory to clients that need that. So thank you. That was awesome, Kinsey. Um, yeah. I I'm going to run through a couple of these questions in the chat, which I think are maybe more story related or kind of at the intersection of story and design. But before I do, if anyone kind of has some final questions for Kinsey on what you just saw, we can uh, send over that. We can send over a PDF of that. Uh, and obviously you'll have the recording. But uh, yeah, if anyone wants to, to ask Kinsey anything before we pivot a little bit back towards how it all pulls together, uh, let's let's do that now. I know you said you use Google Slides, but is there are there any like good deck templates out there that are kind of like good starting bases that have a lot of stuff in place already that you tend to like? I've been using yeah. Beautiful AI and they've got some built in, but I mean, it's a little limited to what it can do. We're, we're hoping to release something like this one day. <laughs> uh, we have it. In, we have it internally. But uh, yeah, Kinsey, I'm curious your thoughts. Uh, there are things out there. There are things out there. Um... I also like to get inspiration from uh, pitch decks on Pinterest, on um, on Behance, on Dribble. You can look up different uh, ways that people have laid out information. It's always good to see what's out there and how people are uh, creating hierarchy and layouts. But to have it all template templatized, um, there are websites that can buy templates from um and i can find those links and put them in the chat i'm blanking on the name of the the website right now but from our standpoint we create everything kind of custom to the margins to the type and to everything else else so we create kind of new layouts for every brand so we don't really stick to one template we have kind of an idea of the types of slides and what needs to be in there we kind of custom adjust it so we don't have anything that we're using that's like a stark template for each brand but i will yeah, send some, I'll send yeah. some. Well, well, I, yeah. what i on the flip side like and we'll get to this in our, a second there are layouts that uh are anchor points right. and this is i think what we would maybe want to release one day is hey like these are the foundations of a lot of what we do obviously you need to tweak it to be made for your information but I think there's some things that we do find ourselves going towards to, to express certain parts of a story. We've used swim lanes and like a go to market slide like 20 times at this point. And we, we can show you what that means, but there's some some ways of expressing content that, that works better than others. Definitely. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, um, have you guys ever heard of a, a platform called Slide Beam? Um, and they, they, yeah, yeah, and then um also I, I wanted to ask how do you guys differ, differentiate from them and then to um if they're I use Illustrator yep. um to make slides and I was wondering if there was like a way to set up the margin if uh Kenzie if you use Illustrator what what some cheat codes were to like set up a margin because I know on like Adobe XD you can do it really e easily um and in Figma but 
um in illustrator i can't figure out how to do that and i just kind of have to like like use other slides and and like um use the alignment tool or something like that but there's like a cheat code um to, <laughs> definitely i can find a resource for that as well um it's kind of there's like cheats like does that designers cheat and like make like boxes <laughs> they'll like be like this is the margin and like throw a box on each page of illustrator um if you want to get like really i don't know nitty gritty with it but there is a proper yeah, way that's to... how i'm doing it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a proper way to create margin um it is yeah illustrator is nice it's just like hard to see all the decks together unless you have it on like one artboard and you're seeing them in a row um i feel like a lot of our founders um, that we work with really love using Google Slides. It's super easy. It allows everyone in their team to edit it and have access and comment on it. Um, and that's what we use, but Illustrator is a whole new a whole new ball game to create a deck in. So I will definitely uh, give you a link to, to create margins in Illustrator. Alex, wanna take the slide, Bean? Sure. Um, I mean, I'm familiar with Slidebean. I know that they basically have kind of like a tech enabled solution alongside a kind of a services business where they can kind of advise. Um, I think, you know, it, I, I guess in terms of how we differentiate, you know, I think that there's, I think that there's just, you know, a, a different, I think that they have a larger team and I think that there's like a different level of focus that a, a this small team by design can offer, uh, you know, on the strategic side of things. So I think, um, but I, I'm sure I don't, I'm not familiar too much with their work and I have not come across many clients that have were either worked with them. So I honestly don't know if I have like a great answer for that. Uh, I do know that they've been around for a while and they have a little bit larger of a team than we have. And uh, have kind of figured out various ways to scale with technology. So uh, I think for better or for worse, they uh, they have you know those the, that that capability as well. So my my, my note there was going to be, I, I remember looking into them a bit as we were creating the company, and I think they fit into a lot of what we were seeing was out there, which was kind of design only shops. So you could go to Fiverr and someone could help you with the pitch deck. Or I think you could go to Slidebean and I also think they might have some templates and they might be able to design the deck for you. I think that goes into the whole reason why we created Deck Doctors is we want it to be kind of strategy led and, and story led. And Kinsey brings an invaluable piece to this team because it's really magical when the design intersects with those things. So we're thinking about these layouts so that they can, you know, really hammer home a point for investors. And I think in a lot of pitch decks, you can sometimes see a deck that's been designed but it's not necessarily, it, it's brand designed. The It's not information designed. And like, there's kind of a, a push there, which is we're thinking a lot about not just how a deck is branded, but how everything is laid out for maximum effectiveness for an investor audience uh, and for your story. So I think there's that additional lens. And I think that's kind of always been what we've done is we, we are very strategic. That's uh, even in how we approach the design. Um, let me just kind of, let, yeah, let me just hit through a couple of these in the, uh, the chat. Cause I, I know people want to see some examples last time. And I think that will be a fruitful kind of final note. So really quick from Jonathan or actually, sorry, from Tayaba, uh, we know the value of storytelling, but struggle to showcase that for a hard tech climate business. We don't want to tell the overused story of the climate crisis and don't have a user persona that is relevant to the narrative or doesn't take too long to explain, uh, you know, how would you kind of approach the problem? So I, I think you actually have the benefit here of people know your industry and know, know that uh, climate change is happening and there, there's a big problem to be solved there. So I, I think you're kind of on to something, which is if you start the deck by saying something everyone knows, that's just kind of wasting space. I would actually start really, I would narrow in. So when you're in a niche industry that no one knows about, you can start high level and start explaining the industry. When you're creating you know, a, a hard tech problem for climate, you can really focus on like whatever subsector of hard technology you're in and kind of what, what's missing exactly there. So I would probably start with like the competitive set and build the problem out of uh, the competitors versus feeling the need to kind of play back information people know on climate. Um, any, any, any thoughts there, Tayaba? Is that, is that hit the question? We can't hear you, yeah. but I see you. <laughs>
Beautiful background, by the way. Wherever you're working, it looks very peaceful. Okay. Well, I want to keep running and, and we'll we'll get we'll get back to it. So just to kind of quickly keep going, uh, Jonathan, great question. You know, we're both a B2B and a B2C product. I'm struggling a bit on how to bring in both audiences. So this is one we see a lot. Oftentimes we'll deal with this in the context of marketplaces, but also sometimes when someone has a B2B and a B2C product, the worst thing you can do is have there be two problem setups and two solution explanations. So saying, hey, this is the problem for a person. Hey, this is the problem for a business. Here's what we do for a person. Here's what we do for a business. Because that ends up just getting really lengthy and there's not like a, a source of a center of gravity. So the way that I would prioritize is I think through, you know, where the need is most acute. Maybe there's a way of speaking about the problem that hits both audiences, but oftentimes there's one audience that is either more essential to the business or is where traction already is. So I'd probably build the story around like whichever one takes the priority. And then I would use the other audience uh, a little bit later on. It would come into, you know, how are you thinking about growth? There's this other piece of the puzzle that you're accounting for, but I, I would just try to avoid as much as possible having two problems, two opportunities, two solutions. Uh, and I would just kind of force yourself to, to lead with whatever one it's most acute uh, and then bring the other piece in kind of at the right moment a little later on. I would add, I think that um, investors want to see that your go-to-market strategy is as innovative as your product is. And I think that some people fall into the trap of kind of like showing the innovative product and then creating something more table stakes on their growth plan or, you know, go to market strategy and just highlighting a business model or highlighting, you know, that we're going to go with paid ads, you know, for consumers, you know. So I think that there's always ways to really be divergent and creative with how you communicate your go to market strategies. And so on something that has a, a B2B and a B2C model, I'd look to find a way to show how those two models intertwine to support each other. So for instance, the B2B model might uh, give you, you know, some sort of scalability on the amount of customers that you can approach uh, and that could help fuel, you know, a, a brand awareness for the B2C model and vice versa uh, and show how that there's some sort of flywheel or there's some sort of connection between those two go-to-market strategies. You don't need to have two completely separate teams focused on two completely separate ideas. Um, so just a couple of pushes there. Cool. Um, all right. I'm going to, so, so really quick, hello at deckdoctors.xyz. Easiest way to reach us. I think we're totally happy to answer any of these questions and take a look at pitches. So feel free to shoot us a note, just say that you're from P33 so that, so that you can get through, uh, get through to us, but we're, we're totally happy to kind of take some of these offline as well. Uh, and we can be a little bit more thoughtful too. So really quick, I just want to jump into a couple of presentations. Uh, these were picked kind of based off of what you guys pitched yesterday and you know what we thought could be re really helpful to see. These are both pre-revenue companies that do an amazing job of convincing me that like there's going to be lucrative. Uh, and I think that's what was really exciting. I think both of these raised effectively as well. Um, Alex, do you want to kind of give the a thousand foot, ten thousand foot view on Gleam, uh, and then I'll I'll kind of do a quick pitch. Yeah, I mean, I think you could probably jump into it. Um, the the general gist is that this was a super pre revenue, uh, really early stage concept, looking at the concept of you know creating health plans for big companies and looking at some allegory for small companies looking at kind of how it works at the big company level and how they can find pricing power uh, at, you know, a larger company level and bringing that to the long tail of smaller companies. So um, Mark, take it away. Cool. Uh, and then on the design side, I don't think these people had a brand. So I know we went with like a green and then I think they wanted to change it. So we, we changed the color around a little bit. Kinsey can speak to that, but this was, this is like a, this is, we want to make it feel like a real company that felt right for the space, but I don't think they really even came in with too much of a brand. So right off the bat, we're Gleam and we're bringing big tech health plans to startups. So startups are paying way too much money for healthcare. Uh, there's a method out there actually, that's called self-funding that can cut costs by 50%. It can make healthcare much more affordable but it's currently unavailable to small companies. 
there's a bunch of reasons that's the case. Having a self-funded plan requires all these things like uh, vendor management, a bunch of lead time, uh, and risk mitigation factors. And at the end of the day, it only makes sense now if you have over 500 employees in your company. So while this can save money, it's just not something that people can do. So meet Gleam, we're enabling self-funding through software to end overpriced cookie cutter health plans. So we're a self-funding platform that makes it feasible for even the smallest employers to use self-funding. We have pre-packaged vendors, automated underwriting, and it's all done in 15 minutes. So now you only need to have five employees to break even with a self-funded plan. We seamlessly offer higher quality plans at lower prices. Here's kind of just a quick rundown of the value proposition and why someone would want to do a self-funded plan. Uh, the monetization here is really simple and has a few different uh, aspects uh, and it lets us grow alongside our customers. So we're currently projecting 180,000 in year one ARR from initial traction. Uh, this is all projected, but we have a few letters of intent that would lead to 150 covered individuals. And we also have some really exciting investors that want to accelerate our go-to-market by taking what we do to their portfolios because we can save uh, costs for their startups as well. We have a growth engine in place that will let us become a leader in SMB self-funding and then optimize for insurance at large. And our early go-to-market partnerships uh, will drive basically near zero customer acquisition. So we have fractional HR firms that partner and kind of uh, connect us with early stage companies. We're making self-funding the first choice whenever a company uh, offers health insurance to employees. There's a $75 billion opportunity just in helping SMBs get covered and big insurance and PEOs are not incentivized to change this model. They wanna sell more and more expensive plants. We're engineers who understand big tech, startups, and healthcare. Thank you. So I'll pause there if Alex wants to add additional color. Um, this was one where like, I, I think it, it came together really nicely on our side. And the only piece that rereading it, I'm like, we don't even really explain too much about self-funding, but I think uh, we explain why it's useful. So it almost like the how almost matters less because it's so clear the delta and hey, there's this thing that can save people tons of money, but it's not available. All right, we're we're bringing that thing to market. And there's a couple extra like cherry on tops in here that I think make it really compelling. This is probably like the most unique thing in the deck, which is an investor of theirs would actually be incentivized to bring Gleam to their other portfolio companies. So there's like this kind of really interesting dynamic where VCs want to help Gleam grow and you know, basically anyone who's invested in startups, including like, you know, maybe fractional HR firms who can be involved can help them distribute. So a lot of examples in here of obviously like the design stuff we were talking about, but, you know, also things like how do you make the pitch unique to you? And in this case, there's a lot of really unique distribution points. So when you're an early company, how you're going to make money and get to market so important. And you can't just be showing that you'll post Instagram ads or do what everyone's doing. I think that's assumed. Uh, here, there's a lot of like very kind of unique points that would only ring true uh, to Gleam. So Alex, any other thoughts here? And then I will pull up the next one. You're muted. Sorry, I, was on mute. I was on mute. Let's, uh, let's jump to the next. We only have a couple of minutes. All right. Um, okay. So this company was so early that they didn't even have a name. Uh, and they're creating a robot that changes tires. So we all like the movie Wally, -E, and I think we just named it Wally -E so internally we could talk about it as something. Uh, we needed an ability. We needed to have the ability to discuss the deck uh, while we were helping make it. Um, but this was actually coming from a really impressive founder who uh, he did like a year of. I think he had an exit maybe, uh, and then did a year of research. Uh, to figure out what he wanted to create. And he landed on like this really kind of niche thing, uh, this realization that auto shops need uh, robotics. So this was kind of inspired by, uh, I think, Nana's hardware company. And I know, you know, many people here uh, are building physical things. So this is uh, an actual physical product. And I think uh, it's cool to see how that can get addressed in a VC pitch. So we're Wally -E and we're creating the auto shop of the future. Uh, the labor gap in auto repair is ballooning. So there's this quietly massive market of almost 200 billion being spent on repairing cars. 
but there's barely any anyone taking these jobs to do it. And that's because this whole system is super antiquated. It takes uh, you know 60 minutes to change a tire still, and people wait four hours to get them. The industry is just not uh, hasn't changed in 50 years, and no one really wants to work in it. Um, so repair automation is the future, and now is the time. Uh, we finally have this combination of trends where there's this desperate need that's been around for a while with repair shops. And finally, advances in technology like computer vision and cheaper robotics make it possible to automate this. This is like a why now slide. We call it the problem, but I think great way of showing a why now, which you might want to have in your pitch, many people do, is having there be intersecting trends or like, hey, there's this one thing that's been a trend for a while, but now there's something else that allows there to be, uh, you know, it puts it over the, the threshold of, of being something we can solve. So meet Wally. We're turning today's auto shop into a robotic pit stop. We're taking four hour repair times and we're doing it in 15 minutes with uh, triple the margin. It's dependable, reliable, and fast. We're the first fleet grade automo automotive repair robot. This is a really important thing to mention because if you are in the industry, you would have heard of a company called RoboTire. RoboTire is in like the auto shops that all of us would use. Some people, you know, have it. It's basically providing limited services, low throughput to consumer vehicles. But what Wally is doing is they're focused on fleets. So they really want to be able to service many vehicles at a time for like the USPSs and the Amazons of the world. So they're actually taking a B2B approach. Uh, and we want to make it clear here that they're not like the robo tire that you might know about. They're uh, they're going a completely different route and they're focused on fleets. So months of research uh, led to us validating this concept. We talked to all these people in the industry uh, and have potential support from these amazing companies and automotive. Uh, this is really important to note because they don't have traction yet. So this is another way of showing traction if you don't have it. And I'll go super fast through the rest. Uh, they have a clear path to revenue servicing leading U.S. fleets. So if you get into one fleet warehouse, then you can expand to many. Really great kind of growth model uh, if you can go one to many. So we want to show how fleets provide that. And then they're going to move from commercial fleets to big rigs and then consumer cars. So they're starting in this $14 million vehicle space, and they might end up in one where they're doing 150 million, million vehicles. So great way of connecting a product roadmap or a growth roadmap with a growing market. Um, they're starting with tires, but over time they can do tires, brakes, windshields, dents, scratches. Uh, so another way they'll grow the market. Uh, and then they're starting in the US, but then can also move, move to Europe and Japan. So they're founded by roboticists and uh, they're conducting their seed round. This is a favorite of mine. I think it's a great way of proving to someone that you're going to make money, even if you're not making money yet. Uh, there's just so many slides in here that show that they really have their head uh, screwed on right around growth. They understand the dynamics at play. They've done their homework. Uh, and, you know, they really see how this could balloon into a major, major player uh, in a underserviced space. So I'll stop there. Uh, I know we're up on time. Thank you guys for bearing with me. Uh, yes, we can, we can get those decks over. Um, and yeah, anything I missed, Alex or Danny? Uh, and if not, thank you, everyone. We can, we'll, we'll take more questions offline, but it's been such an honor to uh, play a small part in your journeys. Nope, nothing for me. I want to thank you guys all for taking the time to listen to us talk. Hopefully you find some value in uh, as you, as you put your fundraise and your pitch decks together. Um, uh, you know, these can be intimidating, but, you know, I think that really thinking about your story and figuring out how to bring it to life with design and copywriting, it can be really fun and foundational for a lot of things beyond the, the, the fundraise. So hopefully you embrace this, uh, this journey and, and, uh, you know, um, enjoy the, enjoy the process, but yeah, I want to thank Danny for giving us the chance to talk with you guys and, and thank everyone for being here. Of course, feel so lucky to have you all with us, Alex, Mark, Kinsey. This is great. Um, thank you so much for your willingness to work with our founders um, now and then uh, in the weeks and months to come. Um, if anyone has questions, I think Mark looped the email in the chat. I'll put that into Slack again as well in the program notion. Um, and hopefully everyone has a great rest of the week, great weekend, and we'll see you all next week. Good luck, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.